Wow. Woo, indeed. Hello, world. What is up? Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Matt Forte. We are here live at the Build studio in New York City. Uh, real quick, though, before we jump in, I have to say a quick thank you to our friends over at Macy's for bringing just a little bit of springtime to the Build stage. Uh, their annual flower show is happening right now through April 7th. It's in New York, Chicago, San Francisco. Uh, and this year's cosmic-inspired theme is the journey to paradisios. That it's as much fun to go to as it is to say. So uh, head on over to Macy's.com slash flower show. Uh, there's tons of info it is not to be missed now let's dive in our next guest has done something truly incredible uh, not only starring in one of the biggest television shows in the world but he's done so for all eight seasons which i know okay some of you already get it on the face of it not a big thing right eight seasons of a show that's a pretty big thing but when you're talking about game of thrones not a lot of people can say that uh and this man can samuel tarley has persevered and i shudder to think what awaits him in season eight uh come april 14th we're all gonna find out but in the meantime i'm stoked because joining me here in just a moment the man responsible for the character we've all grown to love samuel himself the great john bradley's in the house make some noise for john please make some noise I can't wait. We're going to bring him out in just a second. But before we do, I believe we have a trailer for the second se uh, for the final season. So uh, let's go ahead and run that clip. I know death. He's got many faces. I look forward to seeing this one. Everything you did brought you where you are now. Where you belong. Home. They're coming. Our enemy doesn't tire. Doesn't stop. Doesn't feel. I promise to fight for the living. I intend to keep that promise. You got to make an insane amount of noise right now. John Bradley's right here. John Bradley. What a lovely welcome. Thank you so much for that. John, uh, thank you so much for being here and uh, finding some time to come hang out with us. We uh, People are out of their minds excited right now for this show. Uh, and, and it is really cool to have you with us. How, how are you doing? How's life? How, how are you feeling about the whole thing right now? Life's pretty good. I mean, I mean, the thing is, we're just as excited to see it as everybody else, really, because, you know, not only that we wrapped so long ago, and we actually shot this season a long time ago. We started shooting this in October 2017, and we got wrapped last summer. And, you know, normally we're off the air for... A year, but this time we've been off the air for like 18 months, and so we've really kept people waiting for it. And we've been waiting as well, and, you know, because there's so much about this show that we're not involved in personally, yeah. we shoot our little bit, and it's not, like, it's not like a kind of Mad Men thing where your lead character's in every single scene. Right. We all kind of work on our little patch of the quilt, and then it gets stitched together into this great thing, and I think that's always been the case. We've always been really excited to see the other work that everybody else has been doing. And we become fans of everybody else's work, like fans of the show become fans of the show. And so that's, that, that's a really great thing that, that we've got all that to look forward to as well. 
I, I definitely want to get into uh, some of the early stages stuff because you have been on the show from the beginning, and I'm excited with some of that. But something just about this moment right now that I want to talk about. This is you're you were on the cover of Entertainment Weekly. You had yeah. your own emoji uh, on Twitter. You, I mean, there's so many uh, incredible things. They, they HBO hid physical thrones all over the world I for know, this. I like, know. there's so many crazy things going on. What is it like to be a part of, of, of that energy for that all to be around a thing that that you made that you're a part of? What what does that feel? Feel like it. It's 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 a very satisfying thing. There's no doubt about it. That it's a very satisfying thing to be part of something that's so big and so and so widely watched and so widely enjoyed. But I, I think the size of the show kind of has nothing to do with us. Yeah. You know what I mean? You drive yourself crazy if you want to make a big show, yeah. because we're not we can't concentrate on making a big show. We've got to make a good show, and then it's, it's got to be a good show before it become a big show. So it's kind of we're just kind of concentrating on getting the quality right. Especially now, because you know the show's grown so much, and when you go into the final season of anything, you just don't want to be one of those shows. There are right. you, there are shows you can name that you've loved all the way along, and then you get to the very final season, and it's like ah, oh, yeah. it's not it's not quite landed. And and I think that you're in danger then of forcing people to kind of reevaluate everything they'd seen before because it let them down right at the very last minute. And we just didn't want to be a show like that, and we wanted to we wanted to maintain the standard, and that's why we're not doing. 20, 25 seasons of this. I'm sure HBO would like us to, and I'm sure that a lot of the kind of fandom would like us to as well. But the fact is that, that, that we're telling this story in eight seasons and then getting out while we still think we're doing work of the standard that we've set. You know, speaking of that, the, the, it, there's so many rumored uh, spin-offs that are in production and prequels that are talked about. Would you, having been with the show for so long and, and, and finally kind of putting a cap on it, would you ever entertain the idea of returning to the world in some capacity to tell a different version of the story or tell an earlier story? I'm not suggesting you are involved or anything. I'm asking purely, would you personally be interested in going back after saying goodbye? No, I think, I think I'm kind of a purist about it. And I, and I think that we've, we've done our time and we've helped to establish this landscape. And we know that it's got a lot of life in it. And, you know, there's so... M the, the great thing about George's writing is it's so detailed. It's as detailed as history. So all of this came out of George's head. There's a history to it and there's a mythology to it. And, th and there's a future to it as well, if you like, that, that, that's kind of ripe for the exploring. It's very kind of fertile territory for drama and further exp exploration. But I think our time on it is over. And I'm interested to see what other people do with it. I know that, that the pilot uh, for the prequel is in very, very good hands, and I can't wait to see that. But I think, I think kind of our watch has yeah. ended. <laughs> <laughs> certainly not the first time you've said that, huh? No, <laughs> certainly not. <laughs> Let me ask you. Let me ask you this. You know, having been on for eight seasons, you've done press before. You've gone around. There was a fun moment the other night. It was on April Fool's Maisie. I don't know if you saw. She was on uh, uh, Fallon or what have you. Yeah. How and brilliantly they, executed was that? that was it was fantastic. superb. Yeah, I love that. Have you carried around the weight of potentially doing that by accident at some point for eight years, and now you're relieved? I mean, almost. I mean, we have to get through this interview. But uh, you, <laughs> you've escaped virtually unscathed. Especially your character, who's been at the center of so many uh, pivotal discoveries and important moments. Have you? Ever Ever gone out into the wild and thought, oh man, I hope I don't slip up and say something? No, I think I think I'm pretty good at keeping a lid on it. Really, I mean, I mean, I I, I kind of I'm helped by that because although a lot of, a lot of my friends do watch it, my closest friends yeah. don't watch it, I th I, and and you know my best friends that I've known all my life, they don't really watch it, and I think they don't watch it because they they've tried to watch it and they like it, and then suddenly there's me. There's John. What's John doing and, there? And it's, and it's so clearly me, and there's, no, and there's nothing I can do about it. And then that kind of pulls them out of it. So I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of lucky. You, you know, you hear about people who've, who, you know, saying that they've accidentally spilled the beans to their best pals or their family and stuff. The people kind of closest to me, in terms of my, in terms of my friends, they don't watch it. So I can, even if I did spoil it to them, they would have no context for it at all. They wouldn't know what it meant. And, I, and, and, I, and you know, I, I, think, I think the main one was... You know, we came home from filming, me, myself and Isaac came home from filming the scene at the end of season seven where we're talking about Jon Snow's yeah. parentage. Yeah, yeah. And we, we, were in, we were in the lift and we just said, we've, sh we've just shot the most important moment in the show. <laughs> and we have to keep a lid on that now for a very, very long time. And sometimes you, you kind of burst with the responsibility of it because you, because you feel it's just too much for one pair of shoulders to bear. You know what I mean? The burden of ruining this show that, 
that people have stayed with for such a long time. And I, I, people talk about, oh, you know, can you give me any spoilers? And but I think that's just for something to say. Yeah. They don't really want me to spoil the show because the clue, the clue's in the name when it comes to spoilers. But I, but I, I think I think I've always had a, a, a cap on it, and I've always played by the rules. I'm always I'm in danger of, not in danger of. I've always had a phobia of getting into trouble. I can't even imagine having to hold a secret that you understand. That, like, I freak out when I know what my mom gets my dad for Christmas. Like, to, to think that, like, you've got, like, this secret that you've got to sit on top of now for X amount of months and, and how many people think they want to hear it. But, you know, they, they don't. Uh, it's still just this sought-after information. It must have been... Was that an adjustment to, to... kind Or is it great that that came towards the end that you realized that you've you've built up sort of a, a thick skin to that, 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 that muscle that you need to use? Well, I'll tell you what. Always... The, the, the best time of the year for us, 100%, was, was the very, very brief period of time in between one season of the show being broadcast and then us getting the scripts for the next season. That's just a glorious time because that's when you know as much as everybody else. And when people say, what happens next season? You can say, I don't know. <laughs> and you mean it. That, that's, that, that's, the, that's the kind of last time you're able to tell the truth about it. Because as soon as you get the script and as soon as you read it, you're like, oh, well, I'm, yeah. this has turned me into a liar now. Yeah. And, this is, and this has kind of turned me into a slippery character who's going to be avoiding spoilers for the, for the rest of the year or whatever. So ignorance is bliss. Yeah. And as soon as you know, I mean, I mean, you know, you take the kind of Jon Snow is Jon Snow alive or dead thing. Yeah. I did know that for, for, you know, for, for quite a while. I was one of the first cast members to find out that he wasn't, or he was dead, but he came back to life. And, you know, just having the weight of that responsibility. I remember I, I was at a Metallica show, outdoors show, yeah, sure. and we managed to get onto the, the, the mixing right. platform with a great view of the show. And, half, and halfway through Metallica, I decided I needed to go to the bathroom. So I walked off the back of the, the mixing desk where there's a kind of, a kind of port, a potty set up behind, and people around the back of that, thousands of people saw me. And it's all at once, is Jon Snow dead or alive? <laughs> and, 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 you know, when you get people demanding something of you en masse like that, it takes a very, very strong will to not crumble. But I, I, I don't know how we managed to keep that. That was, that was probably one, I, I can imagine, that's probably one of the big, like, Carice uh, was here last night, uh, you know, and she was talking about the exact same moment yeah. of how she felt bad that she had to lie, that she, that she had to go around lying. Well, he's, he's dead. I don't know if he's dead. Is he, is he not? And it was just like a hard thing to have to do. I, yeah. I want to go back, though, because there's one thing that I'm really fascinated by in reading up on your story, man, that you came into this show. Uh, it, was your, it was your first audition out of drama school. Yeah. Talk my about hitting my the My first audition. Well, I know that it's, it's kind of strange now that, that I'd literally just finished my drama school training. I, I mean, I was still there when, when, when I did the first round of auditions for that. And I remember now thinking that I didn't know anything about the, sh the books or anything. I didn't, I, all I knew when, when, when the kind of information came through was that it was HBO, which suggests you know, a certain level of quality, and that Sean Bean was in it, which gave so much credibility. Oh, and I, bummer. Yeah, no, <laughs> and I just... He was in it for a little bit. And I just, and I just kind of thought, you know, this is beyond me. I'm not really going to get this. Right, right, right. And there's no way I can get this, because look at the standard. I'm really inexperienced. I've just finished my training. How am I going to get myself into this show? So I wasn't even thinking about getting it. I was just, I was just thinking about not embarrassing myself and, 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 giving my, and, and not giving my agent a reason to think that I couldn't do what she'd signed me to do. And, and yeah, but as kind of time went on and I, it looked more and more likely that I was going to get it, that's when it started to sink in. And as soon as you get something like that, it's really weird that the, the joy that you have when you find out that you've achieved something like that is very, very short-lived. You celebrate briefly, and then it's like, oh, well, I've got to do the job now. You know what I mean? I've got to do the job, and, and, and these people have put a lot of faith into me, and I have to kind of repay that faith now, and I have to actually do the job and reward their trust in me with this character that they've spent so long creating. So it was then that, that the hard work kind of started, really. But my first audition, yeah, never would I have thought that I'd have got in that. Do you remember anything about the audition? Like, how, like what would you have to do, or would, was it... Were you, were, you su were you super nervous? You just described, like, going, oh, I'm not going to get it, but if you don't think you're going to get it, so then are you not nervous? Like, what, when you, right before you opened that door, what do you remember? Just, yeah, really nervous. And, uh, and just, just real nerves, and, and, and because, because I, I think that there's a thing about, about British actors that, that you feel like a kind of big fish in a small pond, or, or in my case, a small fish in a small pond. But when you, but when you start 
audition in front of Americans. You start to think like, whoa, this is this is really kind of big time now, and 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 this is it, and this is Hollywood, and and uh, you know, it's, it's my first taste of Hollywood, and even if it is just this audition, nothing else becomes of it. Then then I, I I've still encountered Hollywood in some way. So all of that all of that was playing into my mind. And then when you when you got in there, you just got to do the scene and acting. Acting, you know, in front of a camera or acting for producers in, a, in an audition suite is pretty much just the same as I've been doing when I was at drama school. But it's, the stakes are obviously higher and the consequences of failure are higher. But, but yeah, it was, uh, it's just down to can you or can you not do the job at the end of the day. With this having been your, your first show, your first audition, you get out there, you see something of this scale. What has that done for your perspective when you've gone on to do other projects now and worked on other sets and you're like, where's the giant dragon? Where's the this? Like, you've, you, this has yeah. set such a high bar for anything else that you can go out there and work on. What's, what's it been like uh, getting, getting out into other, uh, other projects and seeing other sets? Well, and that's, well, that's so kind of true, actually, because, because I think that going forward, you're a kind of fool to yourself if you try and compare anything to Game of Thrones yeah. in, terms of, in terms of the scale of it. Or even just in terms of like, it's not even just the scale of it and the kind of the quality of the work necessarily, it's the people that you're working with. The fact that we're a big cast, but we've all made great friends. Yeah. And, and we've become very, very close. And it comes right the way down, you know, producers and directors and the crew and the actors. We all feel like one big family. So going forward and comparing any other jobs to that even, to even assume that you're going to have that level of friendship with people that you work with. You're foolish to even think that that's going to happen because you're only going to be disappointed in that. You're only kind of going to be disappointed unless, unless you're very lucky with the production values as well and the quality of the writing. So, you know, it, it, I think the more distance we kind of get from it, the more we see just how special it is and the kind of point in time that it is. And now that we're out of it, we're kind of starting again almost. Because, because we don't want to end up in that position where we compare every single job we do to it for so many reasons, because, you know, it's, it's not fair. You, um, how early on in the process, I know you and Kit are like best buds, how early did you guys meet? Did you click right away? Did, it, did you become, but what is the, what's the first thing you guys bonded over back in the day, if you think back? We, we well, we bonded over a lot of things. I, I, th I think on, on a kind of surface level, we bonded over our love of football. Yeah. Soccer, we both love that, <laughs> and we and we both we both love comedy as well, and I, and I've often thought that that a lot of people's taste in that the people's taste in comedy, actually tells you a lot about them. Yeah. I think if somebody likes comedy that's a little bit, you know, a little bit distasteful or just something that doesn't adhere to your own standards or or something that you think is lazy or something that you think is like going into slightly unacceptable areas, that tells you a lot about them. What somebody, what somebody finds funny, I think tells you a lot about them. And Kit liked a lot of funny stuff. Yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I've bonded a lot with people if they like The Office, for example, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, uh, because I think that to both the UK office and the US say, office. Can you specify for me? Both of them, both <laughs> of them really. Both because, of them, yeah, no, for sure. Because I, I think that that tells you a lot about what they feel about self-awareness and actually what they feel about you know, who, who they want to be like in the office. And if they can't see why, you know, the, the kind of David Brent archetype, if they can't see why he's a joke, and if they can't see why his behavior is unacceptable sometimes, if they're blind to that, yeah. then I'm not really interested in what they have to say. But, but I, I think that that's such a leveler for, for people, that, that comedy and football. And it's nice to have something to talk about that, that isn't necessarily connected with the show. We had interests outside of that. But I think on a much deeper level, one of the things that we bonded over is the fact that we were both really scared. Mm. Like really scared because Kit hadn't done that much before either. And we were now in this big thing and he was the lead and I, was, I had a good part, but I wasn't quite the kind of level that he was at at that time. And we were just both quite nervous and quite scared and quite uncertain that we were able to do the job, as I said before. And I think that, that we shared that with each other and we shared our vulnerabilities. And I think the friends that you make when you're scared and vulnerable are the friends that you tend to hang on to because they've seen you at your most vulnerable. And we kind of clung on to each other and we continue to do to this day. We tell each other stuff that we wouldn't really tell anybody else because you don't like to necessarily appear vulnerable to certain people or to the, to the wider world. But because we've seen each other at probably our most vulnerable, that's, that, sets, that set the tone for the rest of our friendship, really. It's pretty amazing. Do you remember a moment where you and Kit talked and it stopped being scary? Do you remember like, like when you guys found your footing and, and you started to figure it out? 
I just, I, I just think that we've learned to cope with it. Yeah. And you never quite get over it because, because I, I don't think you ever should. As an actor in anything you do, you should never get to the stage where you think, right, I'm fine now. Mm. I know how to do it now. I've not got any more worries, any more concerns, because that's how you get lazy. You should always be trying to learn and always trying to better yourself. It's almost, it's almost kind of like exercise. If you, if you kind of lift weights, for example, it should never get any easier because you're constantly trying to perform at your peak and your peak keeps moving. So we're still vulnerable and we're still uncertain. And, but I think looking back on it now, we met each other at a very interesting time. I was, the, I was probably the last good friend of Kit to meet Kit before he became what he's become now. So uh, after I met him, he became a star. But I met him because of the fundamental person that he was. And, and that's, that's the person that I've made a friend of, and that's the person that I kind of love as a friend. And, uh, and I think that, that it's always going to be scary, and actors are a strange breed. They're, they're a strange mixture of a confidence that has to be there to do the job, because you have to walk into a room and say, I'm actually the guy for this job when you're auditioning. I'm the guy. Don't look at anybody else. I can do it. But also there's you're crippled by insecurity as well. So that's why actors tend to kind of stay together because they're the only people that understand this, this strange conflict. So it's going to continue to be hard and our careers are going to continue to have moments of uncertainty, but we'll always have each other now and that makes everything a lot easier. It's a beautiful freaking sentiment. You'll always have each other, man. That's a wonderful thing. Have you connected? Uh, he's, uh, I know he's doing Saturday Night Live. He's probably in a bubble. You connected him with him at all this week to see how he's doing over there? I will see him at some point, Yeah, you will but see I, know that, I know that the SNL are kind of working him very hard. Yeah. And, and I think that, do you know what? I think that, that he's, he's kind of the work that he's chosen to do now that the show's finished says a lot of really good things about him. He's done a play, did a play in London that I went to see that I loved and I thought he was wonderful in. He's done doing SNL. So he's kind of not willing to rest on his laurels. And I think after, after such a long run in a show, such a big show that everyone's seen and everybody's identifying you with these characters, we all want to show the world that we can do other stuff. And I think I think Kit's making brave choices, and and you know challenging himself. And I think that that's a great testament to his ambition and his kind of desire to work hard. For sure. Um, we're gonna. I, I will go to the audience questions in just a minute. I'm not gonna eat up your time. I promise. But obviously, I can ask you a million different things here. So I'll just ask you a couple more. I wanted to talk to you about because she, she, Hannah was just here this morning and had wonderful things to say uh, about working with you and the relationship uh, between Sam and Gillian. I'm just curious uh, of what, from your perspective, what, what that's been like, the two of you growing together, how you, you sort of mapped out and the, the, the way their relationship would feel and play and how you guys kind of worked with one another to, to find Sam and Gilly and, and, and make that real. It was, a, it was a wonderful working relationship to be a part of. And I, th I, and I think that, that it's kind of a unique one as well because even in the midst of this big show with all these, you know, Principal, hundreds of principal cast and battles happening everywhere and big CGI things. A lot of kind of our stuff has been very low key and quite quiet and just about two people talking. And I think that it's been a real slow burn and the, and, and, you know, the establishing of their relationship has been a real slow burn and it's taken a lot of kind of patience for the audience to stick with it. And I'm sure some people would have thought, why are we watching these two falling in love slowly when I could be watching a dragon burn a village to the ground, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I do kind of, kind of understand that to some degree, but I think that it had to be a slow burn, the establishing of that relationship, because they're both so damaged. Yeah. And what it's essentially about, it's seeing two people heal each other's scars. And I think that that's, that, that's one of the reasons why the show is so kind of successful, because it combines the, yeah. the, 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 the cinematic and the... And, the, and, you know, the, all of that stuff with humanity. And exactly. a lot of the scenes that happen between Sam and Gilly, if you change some of the names and change some of the language, they could be in any drama you've ever seen. Absolutely. They, could, they, could be in, they could be in a low-budget indie movie set in New York now. Yeah. You know what I mean? And because, because that kind of pain and those type of personalities, they're just very relatable. And I, think in, I think in the middle of it all, you do have to have humanity because if you don't take, a, if you don't take the time to build those characters the audience aren't going to care about them. And if the audience don't care about them, they don't mind seeing a dragon 
burn yeah, them. The dragon burning them has no weight at that point. <laughs> so anything that, anything that we do, any big moment that we do, any Battle of the Bastards we do, only works because time and patience has been invested in getting those characters to that point. The Battle of the Bastards only worked because you knew what it meant to John. If you didn't know what it meant to John, if you just saw that episode, it'd be impressive, visually, spectacular, but it'd be, you wouldn't care. And I think that that's, that's what this show really does. It's, it's got a great humanity to it, and it makes you care about these characters before it breaks your heart. This, um, yeah, <laughs> that's a pretty apt way to describe it. Uh, you know, you've, you've been there since the beginning, man, season one to season eight. It's been such a huge part of your life. Uh, as you, as I'm sure, have been asked a million times over the past couple of days and will until this airs, to reflect on that time, what for you is the thing that you, that you see yourself taking with you from this experience, uh, the, the big takeaway that you're going to carry with you from project to project, from thing to thing, the, the, the thing you'll always remember and think back on? Well, the show, as I said, you know, I, I came to this show fresh out of drama training. I, I went to a very theatre-based drama training college. We only did three hours of TV training in three years. So my fourth hour in front of a camera was my first day on Game of Thrones. So I, I, I know, I kind of came to it knowing how to act. But the whole business of acting for camera, which is a completely different discipline, I was a little bit green about. And I think that's where a lot of that insecurity came from. The fact that I'm suddenly having to hit marks. I've never hit marks before. And, and what do you mean, get out of his light? What can that, what can that possibly mean? And, 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 I, and, I think, yeah, and I think that, that what it's done is, what the legacy of me is, it's trained me how to be an actor for TV. And it's the best training ground ever. And I, and I, think, I, th I think the reason why it... it it's been so effective for all of us as performers. Is it really, it's really invested in us a culture of working hard because you see how hard the crew work, every single one of them, and you see how hard your directors are working and your producers are working, how much time's going into the writing. So you just think, well, when it comes to doing my shot in front of the camera, I better be as working, hard, working as hard as them because otherwise I'm going to be doing them a disservice. So I, I, I think it, it's, it's, taught, it's given me the tools of the trade. And every, every, every job I do, every single frame that I film in the future will only be allowed to happen because, I've, because of the training that I got on this show. And, and you know, the, the patience that people showed to me in the very early days when I didn't quite know, I was, know what I was doing, the kind of faith that David and Dan put in me that I'd be able to play this character for the next nine years, eight years, nine years, all of that stuff is such a boost. Because yeah. sometimes, you know, you're going to feel vulnerable and you're going you're gonna to think, oh, do you know what, I can't actually act. You do know that I can't act, right? <laughs> and, and you're going to think, well, do you know what, I may not be able to think that I can act, but David Benioff and Dan Wise think I can act. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of focus on that seal of approval rather than kind of bury myself in worry. So I, th I think for all of us, it's been, it's been a hugely formative experience. It was my entire 20s, and nobody goes into their 20s the same person they come out. But, to, but for my 20s to be so closely associated with such a, such a wonderful experience, it's, it's going to stay with me and I'm sure the rest of us for, for the rest of our lives. Uh, we we got to go to some audience questions. Our first one's going to come to us uh, from Twitter. This is from at Estelle M. Stone. Uh, says, what has been your favorite storyline to watch unfold throughout the entire series? In terms of uh, another character, it's been... Not that I'm saying if it's not mine, then it must be another character. <laughs> Let's start uh, there. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, Sansa. Yeah. I think that, that, that there's so much in that story about what she's suffered and and the kind of emotional and physical scars that, 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 that she carries and the kind of torment that's been, and abuse that's been inflicted on her and how she's really been kicked around by life and the kind of the way that she's still somehow strong and has still kept her dignity after it all. And I, I think that, that a lot of that is down to the writing, obviously, and, and what a wonderful character that was created by George and, by, and adapted by David and Dan. But I think Sophie's sustained performance over the course of this series is my favorite yeah. performance because she makes you feel everything she's feeling and she's one of those she's one of those people who she really makes you care about that character you know what i mean Be because she's got a she's got a kind of magical quality to her yeah. 
It's the same with Maisie, but I think I, I think Aria's kind of course through things, although she'd probably be my second favourite, actually. Her, her, her course through this has, has just been slightly less... Uh, slightly less harrowing. I, th I, I think to see what's happened to Sansa at the hands of all of these vile people in her life, it's really unpleasant and really, and really disturbing. And Sophie's humanity and Sophie's kind of re relatability and the, 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 the amount that you care for her when you see her on screen, that's just made that entire journey possible. Because David and Dan know what you're capable of. They know what your strengths are as writers. That's why they're so sensitive as writers. And they will write to your strengths. And they saw that Sophie had this incredible emotional range. And they just think, well, you know, we're going to give her some of the hardest, emotionally hardest scenes to film that have ever been on TV, I think. And time after time, it's a sustained performance. She's just nailed it every single time. Let me ask you, as we, uh, you haven't seen any of the finished stuff yet. No. Are you, not, I don't know if nervous is the word, but I imagine it's going to be very emotional for you to watch the final season. It, it, not just for the nature of the storylines, but also the, the, the finality of it all, the, the seeing the, the last time you did this, the last time you did that. But um, are you at all, what, what, what do you, how do you feel about finally seeing it? Is there any trepidation? Is there any... Or you just you can't wait like the rest of us. You kind of want to just get in there and see it for all its. Um, I think that I think that I am kind of worried about seeing it, but I'm not really worried about seeing it because I, I believe in it so much, and I believe that we've got a, we've made a, six great episodes that are a fin fitting finale to this thing that we created. But I think that even though we wrapped a year ago, that separation happened. But I've been thinking, well, at least we've not been on yet. So at least, at least it's active in our lives. And at least Game of Thrones is active. You read, you read about it in the news. Every day, somehow, they kind of make a story about it. And it still feels like it's an ongoing thing, even though our involvement in it as a kind of professional engagement is over. You still feel that it's alive. It's a living, breathing thing. And after it's been on, and after that final episode has aired, it really is over. And that's, that's a really weird thought. If you think of... If you think right back to where we all were, the last time, you know, the last time we weren't in this, it, it, it was nine years ago. And think of how different we were. And and you know, it feels weird to suddenly be without it. I've never been an actor, as I, as I keep saying, I've never been an actor and not been in it. Right. And now suddenly, even though we rap, now it's now it's over, and people have seen every single frame of it that we're ever going to film. Then it's gonna there's going to be a finality to it that that is going to be kind of hard to comprehend. I think. Yeah. That, that does sound really heavy, uh, but if there was ever a show that will live on forever, be rewatched millions of times and discussed until the end of time, I feel like this is in the running for one of those shows. So I feel like you'll always be able to find a, a, a conversation and a fan, and a fan will come to the show. And Because, I mean, myself, I think I started season three is when I first got into the show and binge-watched the whole thing. Yeah. So I wonder, once it ends, how many people, as big as it is, I still come across people that are like, you know, I haven't seen it yet. i got to give it a shot. It's like, you haven't seen it yet? Like, <laughs> how is that possible? So, like, people will continue to discover it, and you're going to be, I feel like you're going to be recognized as Sam for a while, I think. I think so, but, yeah. I, but... I know that's not specifically what you're talking no, no, about, no, no, ending, no, but, like... No, but, I mean, I mean, even... I, because I do that a lot. Mm. Most of my... In fact, all of the shows that I've really, truly enjoyed, I've watched a long time after they finished, and then watched them all at my own pace. Yeah. And I've enjoyed doing that. And, and, you know, it's a satisfying experience to watch. I only watched The Wire last year. And, and I, Three people judged you. Yeah, Three. well, no. <laughs> I know. But I, but, I, but I loved it, and it's turned yeah. into my favorite show. But I, but I just don't think that people who watch Game of Thrones in the future, specifically Game of Thrones, they're going to enjoy it, but they're, they're not going to know what, what it feels like to be a part of this. A part of this anticipation, part of the the, satisfi the satisfaction of the anticipation is that we have made made people wait eighteen months for it. And it, and if you can if you can watch the last episode of season seven, and then if you want to immediately watch the first episode of season eight, that's going to be one thing. But the fact that people have been so so gagging for it 
for 18 months, it, it, it adds a completely different complexion to it. And also, I think that, you know, if, if you look on kind of social media and you look on YouTube and stuff, Game of Thrones is one of the shows that's actually brought a sense of community back to TV. Because not many people actually watch... I mean, more people watch it for this show, but by and large, people don't watch TV on TV. And they don't watch it when it's on a lot of the time. They, they, they've got infinite amounts of entertainment that they can watch whenever they like. And they think, did you see so-and-so last night? No, but I'll, I'll get on and catch you up in the week or something. The thing about Game of Thrones is because people want to see it literally the second they can, <laughs> and they don't want to wait until tomorrow to watch it, that it's created a, this, this kind of atmosphere again where it's it, appointment to view. Sure. And that people are going to watch it together. And people watch it in bars. People throw parties and people kind of watch TV like sport and they feel the emotion of it together and they celebrate and they cheer and they cry together and I think that, that you know, people are going to watch it for years and years but, but to watch to watch Hard Home in a bar with other people when you know you're all seeing it for the first time and it's the first time anyone's seen it that's something that, that after this is, is, is over it's going to be hard to recapture. That, moment, that moment's gone, yeah. yeah. Good point. Solid point. Um, we have, what, three? Okay, fantastic. Let's do three more questions from the audience. First one's coming to me right over here. Come on down. Hi, John. Hello. Alana. Um, first off, I wanted to say thank you because everyone needs a Sam in their life, and I think <laughs> that you gave that to the audience. Um, I actually wanted to ask you, how do you feel like you most relate to Sam? And I have to say it in an accent because that's yeah. just how it goes. <laughs> That's a great question. I, I, I do relate to him very much. And I think that one of the reasons that I, that I relate to him is that, is that our journeys, our kind of emotional and our developmental journeys throughout the show have actually run parallel to each other in terms of, as I keep saying, how much I kind of believed at the start that I couldn't do this job. And I thought I was incapable. And I thought, I'm, I'm just going to fall short here. I'm not going to be able to do it. And as, and as kind of Sam's gone through his narrative arc, discovering things about himself and actually discovering how capable he is and how brave he is and how worthwhile he is as a character, I've kind of discovered that you know, through, as I've said, David and Dan's faith in me, that I can actually do the job as well. And I think that, that we both came from, we both started at places of uncertainty and vulnerability and well, we keep our vulnerability, but in terms of just really doubting ourselves and believing what people say about us and being kicked around by, by the world a little bit and, and bearing the scars of that. To, over the course of that decade, finding out that actually a lot of the stuff that people said about us isn't true. And a lot of the stuff that we thought about ourselves isn't true. And it's been a pleasure to go on that journey with him and, and grow with him in that way. And it's a kind, of, kind of almost, it's almost kind of m mysterious experience. And I think that a lot of that's down to, you know, you know the casting process. It's, it's not, the casting of Game of Thrones isn't just about the physical or how much you can act. I think that a lot of the characters actually have the same emotional makeup as the characters they play because of stuff that's happened to them in their lives. And I think people say to me, if you could play any other character, who would you play? And I think, I don't think any of us in the show could play any other character. I think we're perfect for the characters we play because we bring our whole life experience to it. And that's just some kind of weird cosmic thing that's affected that we had nothing to do with, but it's all adding to the kind of mystery of what makes the show the show. Yeah. Thank you for Thank that. You for your question. That was a great question. Thank you. We've got time for two more. Next question's right here. Go for it. Hi, how are you? My name is Rochelle. Hello, Rochelle. Hi. Um, my question to you is, what has been the best feedback that you've received about your work on Game of Thrones, yeah. and why has it made such an impression on you? Well, that's... Yeah, there's, there's a very specific moment about... Uh, it happened a few years ago, and I was, I was, I was out with some of my friends, and, and a young man came up to me, probably 16, 17 years old, and he said, I just wanted to tell you that um, I, I, I love the show and I, and I like your character. And because it, it's because of what I've seen your character do and what I've seen your character achieve and the boundaries that your character has overcome, it's given me the, the strength to ask out the 
girl that I'd been in love with my entire life. And, and I never would have done it if I didn't have that inspiration from a character who thought that he was a coward and actually behaved bravely and found that he was brave. He said that he made me, he made, it made him have the courage to do that. And, and she said yes. And then they were a couple. And I hope they're still together. Because, you know, you talk about the size of the show and you talk about, oh, so many million people watch it. It's got this many followers on Instagram, blah, blah, blah. But you think that's, that's secondary to the impact that you have on people's lives sometimes. And, you know, if I, if I put a couple together who have a loving relationship, maybe for the rest of their lives, who wouldn't have got together if not for that, you think that, you know, you're maybe doing some little bit of good in the world. That's an incredibly you. beautiful answer and a wonderful question. Thank you so much. Kate, we've got one more. Uh, let's go ahead and do it right over here. Go for it. Okay. Hi, John. Hi. Um, the question goes, um, how do you build a character profile for a role? Example, imagining what drives the character. I think that's a brilliant question. And I, and I, think, I think a lot of act actors kind of have the same process of you have to find... It's quite easy for me with Sam, but it's been e harder for me with other characters that I've played. You have to find something in them that's similar to you. And I think that, I, I don't think anybody's good or bad. I think everybody's kind of shades of gray, everything's shades of gray. And I think everybody has everything within them. I, I think that every, if, if you see everybody like a piece of music, everybody's got the same instruments, but they're mixed differently. You know, some people have the temper pushed up, some people have the kind of the humor pushed up and some people have you know, other things maybe pushed down to the difference. And everybody's a kind of remix of the same tune, if you like. And I, and I just think you just have to do a remaster on yourself and you have to find what's inside you that relates to that, that character. Even if you're playing a bad guy, you know what I mean? even if you're playing, you know, Adolf Hitler, you still have to kind of... Not, empathize is kind of a strange word, but you have to find something in him that you can identify with. Right. Otherwise, you're just, you're just projecting onto it. And, you know, I, I think our show in particular, our, our bad guy, you take somebody like Joffrey, for example, you can think Joffrey's a bad, a bad guy, and he is a bad guy, but I think, let's not argue about that, but I, <laughs> but I, think, I think a lot of his anger comes from the fact that he, he is the king, but he also feels weak, and he feels he doesn't have any power, and he feels that his family and the people around him are taking power from him. And when he does the things that he does to women and when he says, I am your king, you can see that that's somebody lashing out at the world. And, and he's angry because he doesn't have the power that he thinks he should have. And that, that I mean, he takes it way too far, I have to say. <laughs> but, Bit of an understatement. <laughs> but, you, but you can kind of empathize with that. And, and, and if you're going to play that guy, you have to think, well, maybe I've, I, I've, never, I've never got a crossbow out. But at, but at times, I've maybe have felt a little bit like that as well. Right. So no matter how, f how much the bridge feels like it is between you and a character, you have to find some common ground somewhere and then build upwards from that, I think. That's an awesome question as well. Thank you, guys. Uh, great audience, great guest, Lovely great time. Audience. This Thank was so fantastic. Yeah. Um, okay. So we're gonna, we got to wrap things up. Uh, John, it's been so awesome having you here. What a, what a great time. Thank you so much My absolute pleasure. For, for carving out a little bit of time in your schedule to come hang out with us. I'll remind the world, as I said last night, and I'll say it again for the four people that don't know this already, uh, April 14th, Game of Thrones is going to be on HBO. Uh, get your friends together. Just create one of those moments. Be a part of one of those moments. John's absolutely right. This is going to come and go. So live it up. Live life. Enjoy it. And have a great time out there. Uh, uh, join me in thanking the great John Bradley for being here. Make a ridiculous amount of noise. Come on, let's go.